Nightmare Reaper is a game you've probably heard of before. It's been in early access for quite a while now, but the full release is launching on March 28th. And with that full release comes a ton of new content. And when I say a ton of new content, I mean three different chapters, all that are around seven to 10 hours long each. And yes, you can pet the dog. Hey everyone, as always, Jarek here. I should start this video by saying that I actually got a review copy of this game for free. It was on my wishlist on Steam, but I only glanced at it, so I knew totally nothing about this game. So they contacted me and said, hey, do you want to cover it? The full game's coming out soon. Sure, why not? Let's play it. I'll make it really clear though that this video is not sponsored by the devs. They didn't pay me anything. They just gave me a review copy of the full game before it came out, which is different from Into the AM because they do sponsor this video. Into the AM makes a bunch of incredibly high quality shirts. I love these things. They fit me perfectly. They're very soft. I've had these since about August. I've washed them so many times I've lost track and they're still very soft. They have no tags, so they don't itch the back of your neck. And on top of that, they have a bunch of really cool designs. And now they went ahead and added hoodies to their website. So if you want a little bit more, you can go ahead and get one of these. These are also insanely soft and very comfortable. Although it's a little bit too warm to be wearing this. So let me go ahead and go ahead and take this off real quick. Oh, hey, would you look at that? Some cool new designs they just added to their website. They're constantly adding in new designs and restocking their old stuff. They also have deals for these shirts. You can get three graphic tees for 60 or three basic tees for 45. But what if t-shirts and hoodies are still too warm for you? Well, they added tank tops to their website. And there's a deal for this channel. If you go to intotheam.com slash dragon shirts, you can get 10% off site wide. And that does stack with the bundle deals I mentioned earlier. So again, intotheam.com slash dragon shirts, or just check that link down below in the video information. And I want to give a huge thanks to Into the AM for sponsoring this channel. They've definitely supported me more than almost any other sponsor has at this point, and they do so with very good products. So please check them out. So usually when someone gives me a key before the game comes out, they give me this sort of event summary, a bunch of bullet points to talk about, say, all right, talk about this, talk about this, not necessarily demanding it, but some things you may want to look at. In this case, they gave me a bullet point saying, here's the things we tried to focus on. If you want to talk about this, then you know, feel free, but you don't have to. I wanted to take a look at their points and see how true each one of these actually are. So let's take a look at their game description. Nightmare Reaper is a dark and violent meld of retro and modern action games. This retro inspired FPS with looter shooter and roguelite elements breaches the wall between classic and modern gameplay. Now, if you just told me that sentence, I would immediately be turned off from this game. However, when they say elements of those things, they really do just mean elements of them. It's not a raw 100% roguelike. It's not a raw 100% looter shooter. You're not gonna be going through the same procedurally generated map over and over again, finding the same sort of loot over and over again. And if you die, you have to do it all over again. You also are not going to have levels tied to your character like in looter shooters just to find better guns with a better number on them. Instead, there actually is a proper structure to this game. And I wanted to make that really clear because if you're not into roguelikes, then you would probably just kind of wave this game away without actually knowing what it is. And I don't want that to happen. So what else do they have in this event summary? Non-intrusive story, the mystery of the nightmare as to the desire to keep playing. And that actually is true. This is actually one of the biggest reasons why it kind of breaks up the structure of a traditional roguelike. The game starts with you in some sort of mental health care facility. You're all alone and the general atmosphere of this place is unnerving at best. You quickly piece together that you're a patient here. If you walk over to this desk, you'll find a piece of paper that will give you a brief look into why you're here. What's your background? What's going on? Every time you go to sleep in your bed, you have nightmares. These nightmares are where the roguelike elements come in. I'll talk about them soon when I'm talking about the gameplay. Every time you wake up, you'll get another piece of paper on your desk telling you a little more about what's going on from the doctor's perspective. At least I think it's a doctor. Whoever is taking care of you. For a person to morph into such a monster deep childhood trauma had to be the reason on top of that you'll slowly gain more access to this facility your door may open one time and you'll find a key card to open that door whenever you want perhaps another door is blocked open by a table again as the game goes on you get more access to this seemingly abandoned facility and something's going on a light may break as you go near it 
Some figure may flash in front of you. Each time you wake up, there's some different scribbles on the wall. Maybe there's some blood on the mirror. As I mentioned, the atmosphere of this place is unnerving. And the devs were not wrong when they say you want to keep playing to figure out this mystery. So there's one thing this game does that's very different from other roguelikes. There's an actual story you will be invested in. Or at least I was. But also the whole time I was playing this game, this general structure for the story reminded me of something else. It reminded me of a Half-Life 2 mod called Underhell. In fact, Underhell did it the same exact way. You would be in this house and something would be odd. Things may not be where you left them, something was going on, you hear something really weird, and every time you went to sleep, you would have a nightmare. Yeah, it's the same exact structure. I don't know if they were inspired by this mod or maybe they were both inspired by something else or maybe this is just a common storytelling technique, but I really like it. Also play Underhell if you're into Half-Life 2 mods, that mod is so good, as long as you don't play chapter one. Why did it go from action first person shooter and in this house mystery to long overdone zombie survival? No, I don't wanna play that. Sorry, I played that mod years ago and that still annoys me. Back to Nightmare Reaper. Next, I wanna talk about these graphics a little bit. They may put off some people. However, I don't want people to get into the mindset of realistic graphics means good graphics and anything that isn't realistic or more up to date is bad because that is not true. I mean, I got that comment quite a few times in my Ultra Kill video and in general got less views on that video, which makes me so sad because holy hell, you don't know what you're missing. That game is so good. The graphics in this game are a bit of a mixed bag. Some of the pixel work is, to be honest, slightly subpar. For example, the animations for the weapons and the enemies are not that great. I mean, they're definitely passable. It's not like they're bad. But if you're going for art like this, my mind immediately wants to compare it to something like, say, Brutal Doom, which may be unfair. On the contrary, though, these environments do look quite good. There's also quite a few of them, so you're not going to be seeing the same texture for the next 20 hours. You may go to sewers, you may go to villages, you may go to hell. You're going to get a good variety here. And it's also a mixture of old and new. Yeah, the textures are intentionally supposed to look old, but then it also has all these modern things, like a modern lighting engine, and this just looks so odd. It's almost like Brutal Doom meets modded Minecraft. <laughs> that sounded like an insult. That was not supposed to be an insult. But yeah, this lighting stood out to me right away. Lighting is criminally underrated because whether you realize it or not, you are going to notice when lighting is off. I mean, light is how we perceive all of our vision to begin with. That's not to say this game doesn't do a bunch more on the back end, but I'll leave that for someone a little more qualified to talk about. What I will say is that some of the areas might have some frame rate issues. More specifically, the villages. I was playing at 1440 and mostly running this around 120 FPS, but the village areas could see my frame rate occasionally tank to around 60 and slightly dipping below that. All the other areas seem to play perfectly fine, it's just the village area. It's nowhere near bad enough to actually hurt the gameplay, but I thought it was weird that this one area had some frame rate issues while the rest of the game ran perfectly fine. But okay, now we get to the real meat of a video game, the gameplay. So let's see what they have to say about gameplay in here. Tons of enemies are crammed in open-ended levels full of surprises and geysers of blood and treasure. Yeah, true. And that goes right in line of one of the other things I say here, a mix of manual and random level generation. Tons of random events and secrets to discover. As I mentioned, the general structure of this game is that you explore the facility as much as you can at the moment, or just go right to bed and skip that if you just want to keep playing the levels, which then puts you into this procedurally generated level. While these levels are procedurally generated, I never found any of them that were like giant branching mazes that I got lost in and didn't have fun. Something is definitely keeping them in check. And as you play through the game, they do continue to escalate, giving you better weapons and better enemies. The different textures are also separated. You may get three sewer levels and then wake up and the sewer levels will be done. You'll get an achievement for it and then it'll skip to village sections, just as an example. And for me, this was the perfect pacing. Every time I get bored of one area, I would find myself in another. And one of the most important things this game does is that at the end of every single level, you're only allowed to keep one weapon. All the others are sold for gold. While this may seem annoying at first, what this actually does is cuts down drastically in the amount of time you find yourself in menus. You won't be micromanaging every five seconds. One of the other things this game does that's different from other roguelites is that if you die, you don't restart the game all over again. Thank God. Instead, you wake up in the asylum, go back to sleep, and start that specific level again with the weapon you had chosen from the level before. This seems fair, it's not too harsh of a punishment, and it ensures that you're going to keep continuing forward through the story without having to play 20 million times. I realized that with Half-Life being the main thing that got me into shooters, if a shooter doesn't have constant forward progression, I find myself not enjoying it that much. So thankfully this game isn't one of those games. If you played Half-Life, you know what I'm talking about. You're always going from point A to point B. You never really sit anywhere for too long. These levels also have a ton of secrets. If you see a crack on a wall, you kick it down and most likely there will be treasure in there. Or there may be one of many Easter eggs.
Is that <laughs> Half Life? Well, now I don't want to get near it. It's either a bomb or it's Half Life. Oh my god, it's Half Life. Yeah, look, there's the Lambda symbol. That's neat. Wait. Mop? Just a regular mop? Does it work? Oh my god, it works. I'm getting gold for this. This is just a visceral cleanup detail. <laughs> Does the bucket work? The bucket works. Oh, hey, Sebby. And while not a secret, at least I don't think it is, every once in a while this would happen. I don't know what's going on here. I don't know if there's a super low chance of just spawning barrels like crazy all around you to get a bunch of loot, or if I equip something that would give me the chance for this to happen, but this is a thing and it happened three times while playing through the game. And once you break through all of these barrels, you are going to have a ton of weapons. Probably a few new ones you've never seen before, maybe a few really good ones. Either way, at the end of the level, you will have a bunch of gold. One of the things they have written down here is that the music and audio is done by Andrew Holschult from Doom Eternal and about a million other games. I am not complaining. One of the first things I noticed when I started playing the game is that the music is really good. I didn't read the event summary before I started playing the game, so my experience was, this sounds super familiar. And then when I looked this up, I was like, oh, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Ludicrous weapon variety. 80 unique weapons, 58 were in early access, that can drop as loot and contain a funky mix of over 30 different enchantment types. Yeah, this is 100% true. I'm still finding new weapons that I had never used before. I don't mean a different variation of a weapon I've used. I mean just straight up new guns. More importantly, these weapons are more than just, oh, look, I have an M14, I have an M16. While I do appreciate getting realistic weapons, in fact, there is a grand in this game that has the ping. That's pretty awesome, but I also really like the more unique weapons, something that you can't get anywhere else. I'll give a few examples. I'm obviously not going to cover all of these guns. We'll be here until the next election cycle if I try to do that. Let's start with the melee weapons. I'll talk about the whip. The whip has a little bit more range than a sword. That's kind of a given, but every weapon in this game has a split function. And in this case, you power up your whip and turn it into an explosive whip. You have just enough space to hit people without hurting yourself, but if they get too close, they'll hurt you and I killed myself a lot this way. My personal favorite weapon in the game though is the Hornet Queen. This thing effectively is just a rebranded hive hand, but is actually good. This thing shoots bees that home onto targets and does a good amount of damage, but also its split function is a little bit gross. And by gross, I mean awesome, incredibly useful. It blocks doors. It, I mean, just look at that. But on top of all of these weapons that you can find, there's a bunch of variations that could randomly be applied to them. For example, one of these makes the missile size larger, which can apply to a lot more than just rocket launchers, like a weapon that fires saw blades, but now the saw blades are bigger than you are. or maybe you'll get random projectile. So instead of getting a rocket launcher that shoots rockets, you get a rocket launcher that shoots black holes. Maybe you'll get a weapon that just has a leech property so it heals you when you shoot enemies. Like, you get the point. With so many different weapons, with so much randomness, with so many different enchantments, none of these guns are gonna end up being the same. This game really is highly replayable. And with the general structure, with there not being quite as much of a punishment from other roguelites, it really encourages you to sort of experiment, see what you can do, try out that new gun you just got, try out your weapons with the power-ups you may come across. These power-ups can do many different things, one of which will allow you to dual wield your weapon. However, if your weapon is already a dual wielded weapon, let me get four arms. Wait, where have I seen this before? I got an extra arm. Beautiful. You ever try wielded? Roger, Cortana. <laughs> Hold up! Oh yes, of course, the gaming pioneer, Cursed Halo. It's fun, and I really do enjoy my time. Multiple game modes, campaign, endless, new game plus, and challenge modes offer high replayability. So yeah, on top of the base game, you have all of that stuff. 
However, the way you unlock it, I find to be quite interesting. For example, with the endless mode, you'll slowly get more access to this facility until you come across whatever these are. And then you go to sleep in this bed over here instead of your bed, and this will put you into a wave mode. So yeah, that's there. Character progression. Use the gold you find to purchase tons of character upgrades and new abilities via nostalgic mini games. This is something I'm actually not too keen on. There are multiple mini games you gain access to while playing through the game. And I do like how the border is a Game Boy Advance SP. Very weird to see it changing games through the top though. Anyway, if these mini games were just optional things there, would have no complaints. However, you need to play these to gain access to these skills, and that's where I start complaining. In fact, apparently the dev agrees. I'm actually adding this after I recorded the voiceover because you can turn these off, and I had no idea. The way I found out is that I got curious to see if anyone else didn't like these mini games, because they were also in the early access build, and I googled them. Very quickly, I found a Steam thread with the devs saying that the mini games were the biggest complaint with a few solutions. The solutions they came up with were A, make the mini games more fun and B, give players an option to opt out of these minigames. However, hide this option so that players have to play them. However, this is the part I don't agree with because the options are buried so deep in the game settings, chances of you finding them or even knowing they exist is almost none. The game never tells you you can turn these off. Hell, the event briefing they gave me for the full launch didn't tell me either. Keep in mind, these minigames give you access to pretty important things like double jumping, dashing, getting more health, carrying more ammo, having more weapon slots, or even passive stuff like taking 20% less damage or ammo drops, dropping more ammo. And it's not like you're going to get these things instantly. You're going to be spending a significant amount of time in these mini games. So I really don't think the ability to turn these off should be hidden deep in the menu without the game telling you at all. Perhaps after they unlock a few abilities, the game will tell you, hey, you can turn these off. Now, I'm not saying this because I don't care about other genres and I only care about first person shooters because that's not true. I play a lot of other games. In fact, one of these mini games pays homage to Pokemon. I love Pokemon. I really wish I could make Pokemon content for this channel, but it wouldn't get views here, so I can't justify it. I have put in an unreasonable amount of time into Pokemon games, into Pokemon knockoffs, into Pokemon fan games, but the Pokemon game in here makes Red and Blue seem deep, and honestly, it just gets annoying when all I'm trying to do is unlock the skill so I can keep playing the game I actually want to play. I'm being really harsh and mean here when I don't actually mean to be, especially since there's a solution, just turn it off. I just wish I knew that beforehand. However, that's my only complaint a subjective complaint about something I'm not a big fan of. You may find that fun. I just don't really enjoy it myself. It's really difficult to complain about something in a game and then make it known that this is not that big of a deal despite the fact that I just spent the last like four minutes complaining. What I'm saying is this doesn't ruin the game, not even close. To end on something a little more positive, let's talk about the bosses because there are bosses in this game and their presentation makes it so that you never know what you're going up against. The general structure of finding out the mystery of this facility wherever you are, your past, getting all these different guns, exploring the depths of your nightmares, is endlessly fun and endlessly replayable. And it'll appeal to a wide variety of people. You don't have to appreciate road likes, they're not generally what I like. And you don't have to be into retro games, this feels more modern as far as movement and shooting goes. For the full release, it easily gets my stamp of approval and I would highly recommend you play it. It's not often a game comes out of early access. I could have stopped there, I'm going to continue. It's not often a game comes out of early access this solid and I have this much to say. So I hope you enjoyed this video. I want to give a big thanks to Into the AM for sponsoring this channel. As a reminder, you can get three graphic tees for 60 or three basic tees for 45 and go to intotheam.com slash dragon shirts to get 10% off, which stacks on these bundles. Also, there is the hoodie and the tank top. You know, you guys remember. I also want to thank people that join me over on Twitch. My Twitch is twitch.tv slash Jarek for Gaming Dragon. If you subscribe on Twitch, you get to see videos at least one week early. I have a video up that's like coming out in four weeks, so you really do get early viewing. And of course, I want to thank all of you for watching this video.